Good day, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Flooding struck areas in the United Arab Emirates as the country was hit by heavy rain, devastating sandstorms, and floods. And strange sounds echoing in Kaaba. Is it a sign of the Lord's return or just a trick for those who do not believe in God? I won't let you wait any longer. In this episode, I will discuss these issues in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. And let's get started. Before discussing the latest moves in Kaaba, let us first review some of its key highlights. The Kaaba, which translates to cube in Arabic, is a modest but magnificent building that sits at the center of the Mecca Mosque. According to legend, the Kaaba was originally built during the time of Adam, the first human being, under divine guidance. Over time, the Kaaba was buried and disappeared, but its foundations remained. God commanded Abraham to rebuild the Kaaba, and with the help of his son Ishmael, they rebuilt it. God sent a stone from heaven known as the Black Stone to be placed in one of the corners of the Kaaba. The Kaaba, 14 meters high, covered with a black silk cloth embroidered with gold, is considered the house of God on earth. Every day, Muslims from around the world bow their heads in prayer in the direction of the Kaaba, the holiest place in Islam. A pilgrimage to Mecca and kissing the black stone is a blessing for every Muslim. Kaaba became the focus of rituals and festivals before Islam became monotheistic. Previously, Kaaba was surrounded by idols and statues of many gods and goddesses, but later it was purified and restored to its purpose of worshipping the true God. Recently, Mecca has faced the challenge of natural disasters heavily influenced by Mother Nature. In 2018, sandstorms regularly sweep across the Mecca area, bringing strong winds and dense amounts of dust. The force of storm winds causes sand and dust to be lifted from the ground, creating a dense sand rain in the air. Sand particles can reach small sizes and are carried by strong wind currents. These storms not only disrupted all religious rituals and activities but also brought severe consequences to the structure of Kaaba. In 2019, the force of wind and sand caused material damage, damaging temple surfaces and creating a dense layer of sand affecting the appearance and aesthetics of the Kaaba. And in 2020, flooding is also a serious problem. Heavy rains, which frequently occur during the rainy season, can lead to flooding in the area around Kaaba. Floodwaters pose a risk of flooding and damage to critical infrastructure. For Muslims, performing pilgrimage rituals becomes difficult and sometimes impossible due to the impact of floods. Furthermore, earthquakes are also a concern. The Mecca area regularly experiences small to moderate earthquakes, but large upheavals can have severe consequences for Kaaba and surrounding infrastructure. And last year, the incessant rain led to flash floods inundating streets and creating widespread disruption. Many important historical sites in Mecca, including the Great Mosque of Mecca, are at risk of severe damage due to floods. Placed between the roots and homes of pilgrims to the holy city, the issue not only affects religion but also causes concern for mobility in the city, with many streets becoming impassable and public transport services delayed. The situation became worse when floodwaters from large rivers increased difficulties for rescue and relief operations. These events pose a major challenge in maintaining and preserving one of Islam's holiest sites. The Muslim community and local authorities must work closely to face and respond to these natural challenges to protect this important shrine and ensure the safety of those making the pilgrimage. In addition to natural events, a number of mysterious events also occurred at Kaaba, causing curiosity and controversy. During the Ramadan dynasty, the Great Mosque was surrounded by a huge swarm of locusts which invaded the mosque space and flew around, landing on the walls and ceiling. Authorities had to deploy teams of experts to spray pesticides and eliminate the locust insects, which are considered a nuisance and a health hazard. This event raised many questions and created an air of mystery around Kaaba, causing people in the Ramadan dynasty to feel worried and concerned about the future of the Great Mosque and its impact on the rich rituals. Their Religious Ceremony 
In addition to the natural events, more notable, according to eyewitness accounts, this sound was loud and clear, like a trumpet being blown. This sound echoed throughout the city, making many people feel scared and worried. This sound lasted about 30 seconds, then suddenly stopped. Many people recorded this sound with cell phones, videos posted to social networks quickly attracted the attention of many users. There are many theories put forward to explain this mysterious sound. Some people believe that this is a natural phenomenon, such as a thunderbolt or the noise of a large animal. Others believe this is a sign of something larger, such as an omen or a supernatural event. Some people believe that this is a hoax by unbelievers. However, some others suspect that the sound is just a hoax. They suggest that this sound could be produced by an audio device or a computer program. This could be a group of people wanting to attract media attention or create a stir. It could also be a group of people wanting to disrupt public order or destroy religion. Some others believe that this is a sign from God, a warning of repentance, and signaling the end of the world. Here I want to talk about the natural disasters mentioned above. First, in Matthew 24 verses 6 to 8, the Lord said, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Take heed and do not be troubled, for these things must come to pass, but it's not the end yet. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In many places there will be famine and earthquakes, but all that is just the beginning of the harm. Among those natural disasters, there were earthquakes. Could this be the second coming of God? Matthew 24 verse 14 says, This good news about the kingdom of God will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. In Mark 16 verse 15, Jesus told his disciples after his resurrection, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. After Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit began to lead those who followed Jesus to bear witness to Jesus. This is the sixth sign of the Lord's return, the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Certain Muslims interpret these occurrences as divine messages from Allah, serving as admonitions for people to repent and ready themselves for the impending day of judgment, citing verses from the Quran and references in the Hadith that foretell signs of the end times, including the advent of the Antichrist, the return of Jesus, and the resounding trumpets. They draw attention to the prevalent moral and social deterioration worldwide. Additionally, they highlight the ongoing conflicts and wars in the Middle East and beyond as indicative of these prophesied times. In response to these perceived signs, followers of Islam advocate for a return to the teachings of their faith, urging people to seek Allah's mercy and forgiveness. They emphasize the urgency of aligning with Islamic principles before it is too late. The troubled state of the world, coupled with the mentioned prophetic signs, reinforces their call for spiritual reflection and adherence to the tenets of Islam. Conversely, within the Christian perspective, some believers attribute these events to indications of the imminent return of Jesus. In this view, it is anticipated that Jesus will reappear to establish his divine kingdom. The interpretation of such occurrences as divine omens underscores the significance of faith and the expectation of a transformative future. In the Christian tradition, the enigmatic resonance echoing through the air carries an undeniable sense of mystery. While I may not be privy to the prevailing speculations circulating beyond these walls, my conviction remains steadfast. This peculiar sound is not to be feared but embraced with anticipation. It is akin to a musical prelude heralding the arrival of something extraordinary. In the Bible, there are also a number of stories related to repentance, forgiveness, and God's acceptance. This is a fascinating story that I want to tell you. This story is quoted in chapter 23 of Peter. The story is called, He Learned Forgiveness from His Master. Peter would never forget that terrible moment when he saw Jesus looking at him. Is there any disappointment or resentment in your eyes? We are not sure, the Bible only reports that Jesus turned and looked at Peter in Luke 22 verse 61. But just that one glimpse was enough for him to see how seriously he had made a mistake. Peter realized that he had just made the mistake that Jesus foretold, 
the mistake he had determined he would never make. He rejected his beloved master. It was perhaps the worst moment of his life. This story is quoted in chapter 23 of Peter. The story is called, He Learned Forgiveness from His Master. Yet Peter's situation was not hopeless because he was a man of strong faith. He was still able to stand up after his mistakes and learn one of the most important lessons from Jesus, which is forgiveness. This lesson is also for each of us. So let's consider how Peter learned this lesson six months ago in his hometown of Capernaum. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? Is it up to seven times? Peter may have thought he was being generous because the religious leaders of his day taught that one only needed to forgive three times. However, Jesus replied, not seven times, but seventy-seven times, excerpted from Matthew 18 verses 21 to 22. Did Jesus mean that Peter should count and record the number of times others wronged him? Are not by moving from 7 to 77 Jesus meant that love does not allow us to limit the number of times we forgive? In 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 5, Jesus showed that Peter was influenced by the unmerciful and intolerant spirit prevalent at that time. People often calculate each forgiveness in detail, as if recording it in a book. However, those who want to imitate God should always be generous and willing to forgive others. Even though he did not contradict Jesus, did Peter really understand the lesson he taught? Sometimes we only fully understand the value of forgiveness when we are in a situation where we need to be forgiven by others. So let's review the events leading up to Jesus' death. During those difficult times, Peter made many mistakes and needed his master's forgiveness. The great moment has come. It is the last night Jesus lived on earth. He still had many things to teach the apostles, such as about humility. Jesus set an example by humbly washing their feet, a task usually assigned to lowly servants. At first, Peter questioned Jesus' actions and refused to let Jesus wash his feet. But then he asked him not only to wash his feet but also his hands and head. Jesus did not lose patience but calmly explained the importance and significance of what he was doing. In John 13 verses 1 to 17, not long after, though, Peter tested Jesus's patience again. The apostles quarreled over who was the greatest among them, and Peter, no doubt, joined in that shameful dispute. Yet Jesus kindly corrected them, even praising them for the good they had done. They showed loyalty to the Master. He also foretold that all the apostles would abandon him. However, Peter asserted that even if he died, he would not leave Jesus. But Jesus further prophesied that before the rooster crowed twice that night, he would deny him three times. Not only did Peter deny it, but he also proudly claimed that he would be more loyal to his master than the other apostles. Did Jesus lose patience with Peter? In fact, throughout this difficult time, he kept looking for the good in his imperfect apostles. Even though Jesus knew Peter would disappoint him, he said, I have prayed earnestly for you so that your faith will not fail and that when you return, you will strengthen your brothers, in Luke 22 verse 32. With these words, Jesus expressed confidence that Peter would recover spiritually and return to faithful service. Jesus is truly forgiving and kind. Later in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter needed correction more than once. Jesus told him, as well as James and John, to keep watch while he prayed. Jesus was in a time of great suffering and needed encouragement, but Peter and the other apostles kept sleeping over and over again. Even so, Jesus still showed sympathy and forgiveness when he told them, the spirit is strong, but the flesh is weak, in Mark 14 verses 32 to 41. Just then, a crowd arrived carrying torches, swords, spears, and sticks. This is the time to act cautiously, yet Peter hastily acted, raised his sword, and cut off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. Jesus calmly corrected Peter, healed the servant's wound, and explained the principle that one should not use violence. To this day, his disciples still follow that principle, as mentioned in Matthew 26 verses 47 to 55. Thus, 
Peter was forgiven by his master many times. His case is a reminder that we all sin regularly. Who among us does not need God's forgiveness every day? As for Peter, that same night, he committed more serious mistakes. Jesus argued with the crowd that if they came to arrest him, they should let the apostles go. Peter stood helplessly watching the crowd tie Jesus up. Then he ran away like the other apostles. However, Peter and John did not flee immediately but stopped, perhaps near the home of the former high priest Annas. That is where Jesus was first brought for questioning. When Jesus was taken from there, Peter and John followed him from afar. Peter was not a coward. It took a lot of courage for him to dare to follow Jesus. The crowd had weapons, and Peter had just wounded one of them. But up to this point, we still haven't seen him show loyalty like he once declared that he was willing to die for the Master, as in Mark 14 verse 31. Like Peter, many today follow Jesus from afar. That is, following him in such a way that no one notices them. But later, Peter said that the only right way to follow Jesus was to try to keep close to him, imitating his example in everything. Despite the difficulties, Peter carefully followed Jesus until he reached the gates of one of the most magnificent houses in Jerusalem. It was the home of Caiaphas, the wealthy and powerful high priest. Such houses often have a central yard and a front gate. Peter arrived at the gate but was not allowed to enter because John, who knew the high priest, was inside and went out to tell the doorkeeper to let Peter in. But after that, it seems that Peter did not go with John, nor did he try to enter the house to be with the master. He stood outside in the yard where the servants warmed themselves by the fire on the cold night. He watched false witnesses about Jesus come in and out as he was on trial, as mentioned in Mark 14 verses 54 to 57, John 18 verses 15 to 16, 18. At this time, the maid who opened the door for Peter could see his face clearly, thanks to the firelight. She recognized Peter and accused him, you two were with Jesus the Galilean. Too surprised, Peter denied knowing Jesus and even pretended not to understand what she was saying. He stood near the gate so that no one would notice. But another girl noticed him and also said, this man went with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter swore, I do not know him, as in Matthew 26 verses 69 to 72, Mark 14 verses 66 to 68. Perhaps after denying it a second time, Peter heard a rooster crow, but he was so worried that he did not remember the prophecy that Jesus had just spoken a few hours earlier. A while later, Peter was still trying to avoid being noticed, but there was a group of people in the yard moving towards him. Among them was a relative of Malchus, the servant whose ear Peter cut off. He said to Peter, didn't I see you in the garden with that man? Peter tried to explain that they were wrong. He swore that he did not know Jesus, and he would have been damned if he had lied. That was the third time Peter denied Jesus. Immediately after he uttered those words, the rooster crowed for the second time that night, as mentioned in John 18 verses 26 to 27, Mark 14 verses 71 to 72. Just then, Jesus went out onto the balcony overlooking the courtyard. As mentioned at the beginning of the chapter, at this moment, Peter saw Jesus's eyes looking at him. Immediately, he realized he had made a very serious mistake with the owner. Peter left the courtyard, his heart tormented by guilt. He trudged along the road in the dim light of the waning moon, the scene blurred because his eyes were filled with tears. Then he burst into bitter tears, as mentioned in Mark 14 verse 72, Luke 22 verses 61 to 62. After making such a big mistake, a person may think that he has committed a sin so serious that he cannot be forgiven. Perhaps Peter himself thought so too. But is that so? It is hard to imagine how heartbroken Peter must have been at dawn when he saw the day's events. Surely he blamed himself when Jesus died that afternoon after many hours of suffering. Peter must have shuddered at the thought of adding pain to his master on his last day on earth. Although his heart ached, Peter did not despair. We can know this because not long after, he reunited with fellow believers, 
as mentioned in Luke 24 verse 33. Surely, the apostles all regretted their behavior on that dark night, and they comforted each other. This time, we see that Peter was in the right spirit. Whether a servant of God can stand up after falling does not necessarily depend on the severity of the sin but depends more on his own strength to rise up and correct his mistakes, accepted from Proverbs 24 verse 16. Peter showed that he had true faith when he gathered with his brothers during a time of spiritual depression. When sadness and regret weigh heavily in the heart, it is easy for a person to isolate themselves. But that is very dangerous, as mentioned in Proverbs 18 verse 1. It is wise to stay close to fellow believers and regain strength to continue serving God, Hebrews 10 verses 24 to 25. Thanks to association with fellow believers, Peter learned the surprising news that Jesus' body was no longer in the tomb. Peter and John ran to Jesus' sealed tomb. Perhaps because John was younger, he came first. When he saw the tomb door open, he hesitated to enter. But Peter was not like that. Even though he was panting, he went straight inside. The grave is empty, as mentioned in John 20 verse 39. Did Peter believe that Jesus had been resurrected? At first, he did not believe it, even though faithful female believers came forward and said that angels had appeared and told them that Jesus had been resurrected, as mentioned in Luke 24 verses 5 to 11. However, by the end of that day, all the sadness and doubt in Peter's heart disappeared. Jesus has been resurrected, now a powerful spirit. Before appearing to all the apostles, he did something special. The apostles recounted, the Lord has indeed been resurrected and appeared to Simon, in Luke 24 verse 34. Later, the Apostle Paul also wrote that on that memorable day, Jesus appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve apostles, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 5. Cephas and Simon are other names for Peter. So that day, Jesus appeared to Peter when he was alone. Hopefully, we can also learn this lesson every day. Do we ask God to forgive us of our mistakes? Do we believe that our sins are forgiven and forgiven? Are we generous in forgiving others? If so, we are following Peter's faith and our Master's mercy. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for the next video.